Welcome everyone to another episode of the Maktasi Street Podcast. My name is Sadi Maktasi. I teach at UCLA and I'm joined as always by my brothers Usama. Hey there everyone. And Karim. Hi everybody. And Karim is at the American University of Beirut in Beirut and Usama is at UC Berkeley. And we're joined today by my brilliant colleague, uh, Robin Kelly. I'll introduce him in a second, who's also at UCLA. Um, I also want to thank our producer, Sina, for all of his help in making this podcast possible. And our producer is the one who asked me to ask our audience to, we hear all podcasts always do this. It always used to get on my nerves, and now I'm doing it too. Please give us a five-star rating, subscribe, and share the podcast so that our audience uh, can grow. Um, today, as I said, our, our guest is Robin Kelly, who's Distinguished Professor of History and the Gary Nash Chair in U.S. History at UCLA, um, elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a major figure in the history culture of, the history and culture of uh, Black American intellectuals, artists, writers, uh, activists, and so forth. Um, he has, he's the author of way too many art, uh, magazine articles and journal articles for me to mention. Also, the way too many books for me to cover in detail. I'll mention a few of Robin's amazing books, which I exhort everybody to read. Uh, two amazing books, first of all, on jazz that are among my favorites of his work. Africa Speaks, America Answers, Modern Jazz and Revolutionary Times. And an astonishing study of Thelonious Monk called The Th Thelonious Monk, The Life and Times of an American Original. He's also the, the author of other works on uh, Black American history and culture, including Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination, uh, Your Mama's Dysfunctional Fighting the Culture Wars in Urban America, and many others besides. Um, so we're really, really excited to have Robin join us for this conversation. And uh, Robin, we thought we'd begin by asking you about the path you took, sort of your own intellectual formation, the path you took um, through the American Historical Archive, first of all, uh, I was reading the other day your your forward to Cedric Robinson. So just the path you took and then also how, obviously, for the purposes of this podcast, how you connected to the question of Palestine during your historical intellectual formation and training. Of course, of course. Well, first of all, I'm just so happy to be on this podcast. I'm such a fan. And by the way, people need to not only um, give five star ratings, but donate money um, to support it. Uh, so let me let me begin. You know, I I grew up initially growing up in Harlem, end up in the West Coast. Um, I I don't come from like any particular kind of red diaper baby family, but my mother's been you know very very active and concerned about the world. But the thing you know, and anyone who comes out of the left, especially the nineteen eighties, you know, was aware of of the question of Palestine. You know, but you know, but how invested one was depended on, uh, you know where you were, what, what kind of left organization. So I had a, an awareness of Palestine. I always stood up, you know, supported the first and second intifada, you know, all that stuff. But what changed for me uh, in a big way was in 2012, in January, when I went as part of a delegation uh, organized by U.S. ACPI. Uh, and by the way, before I left, I read this amazing book called Palestine Inside Out. You know, and, and it, was, it was like my Bible in many ways, because I, I sort of knew a sense of what to expect in everyday life. Right. Um, and so and, and by the way, it's, other people gave me texts to read in order to try to convince me <laughs> that Palestine is not really occupied as if as if they're going to try to trick me. Right. Anyway, I, I go there and I'm there for. Um, almost three weeks, uh, you know, visiting uh, refugee camps. I mean, it's part of the kind of, you know, struggle tourism. Um, but, you know, and I was with some amazing colleagues, uh, Nefertiti Tadiar, you know, people like that who um, who had been working on this question for a long time. So it was really eye-opening, not just to see the extent of, of, you know, colonial occupation, the everyday violence, visiting, um, uh, you know, Hebron, which is a shocking place to be, and I don't need to describe it, uh, 
But what really transformed me in many ways wasn't seeing the oppression, the violence, the pictures of martyrs, the unfinished buildings. It was talking to all these amazing Palestinian intellectuals in these circles, trying to figure out a pathway forward um, and hearing their analysis. And I have to say the smartest people I've ever met in my life were, were people who were involved in the struggle, both in NGOs as well as various you know, formal organizations. And then um, I stayed a week longer because of some research I was doing by myself and went to Nablus and saw even more incredible uh, history of resistance. And I have to say, I know this may seem trite to some people, but I saw a deep connection between uh, the people of Nablus, what uh, that place represented as a kind of side of resistance, and soap factories. I mean, to walk into these spaces where they're making soap by hand, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, the, the, um, the craftsmanship, the elegance, the, I mean, I took pictures of it, you know, and to me, looking at soap being made had way more of an impact than seeing the segregated roads in Hebron. I mean, it's hard to explain what I mean by that, but what you saw was the people in struggle. And I identified with that because that's where I come from. Where you know, growing up in Harlem, but I, I don't remember the um, the lack of sanitation or just the policing. But I just remember the the soapbox soapbox speakers on the corner talking about you know that freedom is coming and this is what we need to get there. So that that connection for me was everything. And from that moment on, I made a pledge. I said, you know, two things. From now on, every chance I get, I'm going to write about Palestine. And two, every time I write about Palestine, I will refuse to take any money, right? If people are going to pay me, pay a movement. So that's the, the two things I've been doing and continue to do to this day. That's, yeah, the, that's a, it's a path that not many people take. And we should talk maybe about that too. Like, why is it that some people, like you obviously took a detour at some point. And it's interesting to think about, well, what led you, I mean, there are things in your formation, your background, your upbringing, your experience in Harlem, your training, I don't know what it was, something clicked with you and you took, you took the, the, the off ramp or the on ramp or whatever to Palestine. Obviously not everybody takes that, takes that detour. And some people see, you know, stick to the, to the academic sort of, the, you know, the straight and narrow path of, of the academy. And, and, but I guess your work never really did hew to the strict academic path in any case. Right, it did. And I should be f fair that um, the, the detour was also um, given to me. And I should mention my friend, uh, Naomi Wallace, who uh, is a wonderful playwright. You probably know her work. She's done lots of work on Palestine. She's, uh, she worked with um, Abdel Fattah Abu Shor on a play. She's worked with... Um, uh, 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 with um, uh, Sim. Um, Ismail Khalidi. Uh, uh, right, Ismail Khalidi. Sim. Um, so, so they worked together. So she was the one who said, look, take this tour to Annapolis, talk to this person, and told me to go there. Um, and so she had a particular kind of insight. Um, she also was, along with my wife, uh, Lisa Gay Hamilton, were, they were on, I think, the second uh, women's boat to Gaza. Um, uh, and so she had this deep insight, which really helped me. And I try to listen. But the one thing is, we don't always get that. I mean, one of my critiques of, the, of as, as important as these delegations are, there's a kind of critique I have about the way the, some of this kind of, you know, call it trauma tourism has been shaped. Uh, in terms of trying to discover, because you know, a lot of things that, that you could see that shocks you, you could see on YouTube. It's, it's talking to people and learning from them and recognizing that we're talking about a very long history. <laughs> I mean, way before even 1948. And that comes out when you actually engage people where they are and understand that we are going there not just to see and report, 
we're going there as part of a struggle and to, in some ways, uh, I felt like to be a kind of partner, uh, in, in some ways a subordinate to, in, to listen uh, and to pay attention and to direct our work to fundamentally the liberation of Palestine. So, you know, reading your book really helped me because of the way in which uh, you went beyond um, simply describing everyday life, you know. It was also about possibility. Uh, and it was about how people experience everyday life as a way to transform it, you know. And that's what I took. So thank goodness for your book. <laughs> Sorry. So Robin, could I just uh, jump in here and just ask about, so this, when you say that it's, it's you're going there and speaking to people, um, does that, so how does that link to, for example, what we're seeing? I mean, we, 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 want, we want to talk about the history, of course, and that we, but also before we get to the history, in terms of the ICJ ruling now and South Africa's role, major role in the ICJ sort of case, bringing the case of genocide to the attention of the world, um, to the world court, at The Hague. I'm wondering, so how does that relate to the fact that this is, that most people in this country, in America, in the United States in particular, um, are sort of, and are, there, there's this split here, but they don't actually experience, they don't have that experience of being able to talk to Palestinians on the ground in Palestine. So what are your thoughts on the ICJ case? And is it, and what about the fact that there seems to be some kind of major shift in the, in the, in American youth and also in the Black community where I just read the New York Times article yesterday about black pastors and and there's pressure brewing from below. Could you just relate to the I tell us about the your thoughts on the ICJ case and the fact that there is most people here don't have the ability to do what you did, which is to go to Palestine and talk to Palestinians. Exactly, exactly. And and by the way can, sorry, can I just also jump in here and, and also ask the the significance of South Africa Kind of bringing this case and and also this the thing when Namibia then adds and says yeah well when the Germans uh, you know came in big defense of the Israelis then Namibians say well yeah but there was also a genocide before this you know so right yes yes these are great questions so let me just begin with a one my first reaction uh, the ruling itself was pretty extraordinary um, I think that at first people might have felt a little bit of disappointment because there wasn't the call for a, a ceasefire. And technically the ruling itself may not have like the enforcement mechanisms, but to me, um, it kind of, it made sense. It made sense because one, it, for a lot of people who are kind of on the fence, it legitimated the term genocide with respect to, in other words, it's been used. In fact, uh, the Movement for Black Lives got into all this trouble because in their August 1st, uh, 2016 statement, they used the term genocide to refer to, um, uh, to, to Palestine. In fact, this is a kind of a side note, but part of the reason that uh, Jewish Voice for Peace had their kind of, you know, I don't want to call it come to Jesus moment, <laughs> but when JVP had their, their kind, of, kind of radicalization and began to embrace the concept of genocide, it starts with Movement for Black Lives and that conversation in 2016. So to go forward, um, it, it, the, the, the ruling itself, as well as the initial case, brought the term genocide to the fore in a way that hadn't been done before. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is that I think there's some historical lessons here. For me, at least, my takeaway was, um, why is it so hard for just ordinary people, for anyone to be able to see and recognize that the violence they're seeing just on television and reading about, that that's an act of genocide. Like, why is that even hard to do, even among liberals? Uh, well, I th to me, the lessons go back to like 1948. Um, and, you know, I was listening to the wonderful um, interview you did with Richard Falk, which was brilliant, when he spoke about victors, the, like the victors' justice, and about, you know, the example of the U.S. dropping like two atomic bombs on civilian populations and why that wasn't considered genocide. And for me, my, my mind went to colonizers' justice, like which is to say neither the League of Nations nor the U.N. 
headed, of course, and controlled by colonizing countries, uh, were willing to declare colonialism like a crime against humanity. And this was this was Gandhi's project. This was W.B. Du Bois, who we'll talk about, his project. I mean, Du Bois was there in 1944 saying, you know, um, colonialism should be declared a crime against humanity. But there's three reasons why this didn't happen. One, the UN uh, was designed, as you know, to recognize nations and not peoples. Uh, secondly, the UN was still making a distinction between civilized nations and the rest. Like you, when you read like all those documents from like 1945 to 19, well, actually you could go up to, to, into the 1960s, they still refer to the general principles of law recognized by civilized nations. Uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, civilized nations was in there until um, India and Soviet Union said, you know, you need to cut it out. Uh, Commission on Human Rights, they restored civilized nations. Um, so all this is part of it. And I think the third factor, which is probably the most important, is that you can't um, you know, imagine attacking uh, colonialism, right? If you attack colonialism, you know, you are also assaulting the sovereignty of colonizing nations. Um, and that is that, you know, and Du Bois writes about this, you know, he says, you know, preserving this Anglo-American alliance after World War II was way more important in the plight of 750 million uh, people throughout the world, uh, uh, African, Asian, Caribbean, Latin America, et cetera. Uh, and so what does this mean for this case? Well, for me, what it means is that, you know, if you look at the period from like 45 to 1950, there are genocides taking place. <laughs> like at the moment that they're debating and ratifying and eventually signing the, the uh, genocide convention, there are genocides taking place in the, you know, colonial world. Um, and the U.S., of course, doesn't ratify it until 1988, I think. Uh, and at the same moment, and this is a very important historical intervention, in 1951, William L. Patterson, Paul Robeson, Patterson is the head of the Civil Rights Congress, which is a kind of left organizing, left organization, black organization. They submit this petition charging the U.S. with genocide because of lynchings, police violence. And it's Raphael Lemkin, the, who's considered to be the, kind of her, the heroic force behind the convention, who attacks the, the petition. He's like, this is a communist plot to divert attention from Soviet crimes and to derail the U.S., um, uh, the, 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 derail efforts to get the U.S. to ratify the convention. And so that's all going on. And meanwhile, South Africa. And here is where South Africa is like in the middle of all this, this mess. I mean, people have talked about how South Africa is important because of Mandela, because of um, Bishop Tutu, because PLO and the ANC had been close, had close ties. But I think if you go back to 48, think about all the things converging at once. You've got um, the ratification of the Genocide Convention. You've got the, the Nakba. You've got the nationalists coming pa to power in South Africa, the Africana Party, led by the likes of um, uh, D.F. Milan and Hendrik Verwoerd. And by the way, the Afrikaners, the, the nationalists, the National Party in South Africa are Nazis. They're not Nazi adjacent. <laughs> they are straight up Nazis. They're Christian nationalists. They identify with the Nazis. They were, they were against South Africa fighting on, in support of the British. And then you have this guy, Jan Smuts, who's the prime minister of South Africa. And, you know, his party is defeated. But what people don't always realize, in fact, you probably know this, but Smuts was, he wrote the first preamble to the UN <laughs> Charter. He was considered a, a human rights dude, right? And, and, and in fact, and one of the tricky things that he did, he was, he was still a racist, by the way. I mean, it's, you know, he, he wasn't against strict uh, uh, apartheid. He was against that, but he was not, a, you know, for equal rights. But what he did was when, he, when the election's going on and it looks like his party's about to lose, he recognizes Israel. It's the first 
Commonwealth country to recognize Israel, South Africa. Um, and why did he do it? Because he's trying to get Jewish votes from Johannesburg to defeat the nationalists, but he's defeated anyway. And the nationalists end up having this kind of dance where they don't want to recognize Israel. And yet ultimately they don't really have a choice. And so 48 becomes this really important moment because that's also around the time, you mentioned Southwest Africa, that you know the, um, uh, South, Southwest Africa is a mandate of uh, South Africa since at least like 1918, 1919. Um, and what does South Africa do? They restore uh, uh, land to German settlers. These are the same settlers that committed the first genocide of the 20th century, uh, the uh, massacre of the Herero and Nama people, 1904 and 1908, wiped out like 80% of the Herero, uh, Herero population, half of the Nama population. And you have this extraordinary moment in 1948. Again, 48. 48 is everything. Where the Nama are trying to get to, South, get to Paris, to the UN session, right? Um, uh, to, to present their case for sovereignty and to possibly bring up the question of genocide. Like they, they, the, 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 the convention had not been um, signed yet, but it's, it's in the air. And what does South Africa do? They ban the delegation from coming to Paris. Um, meanwhile, in 1948, there's a, a diplomat who you probably know, Egyptian uh, uh, Mahmoud Bey Fazi, who's on the floor of the UN General Assembly and fighting with the Security Council. And he's raising this question of the violent displacement of Palestinians. Again, 1948, 1949, 1950, all this is taking place at the same time. And he's talking about uh, Israel's violation of armistice. He's talking about you know, the attacks on demilitarized zones. It's like the language you could lift from 1950 and just drop it right into 2024. Um, and all this is happening at the same time. So to me, that failure to identify colonial domination and colonial racism and violence as genocide is, is what's haunting this moment. And so when South Africa, coming out of its own genocidal colonial past, uh, rejecting that past, brings the case to the ICJ, it is a kind of redemptive act it is saying, here is the error we're trying to correct since 1948. Um, and we've got to be able to recognize that. So to me, all this stuff comes back to that moment. It's more than just a question of, of solidarity over the last 25, 30 years. It is this deep story that has to be righted, uh, corrected. Um, and what does it mean? Because once we recognize Palestine, as subjected to colonial forms of genocide, then now we're not talking about October 7th. We're not talking about 1967. We're talking about 1948. You know, I don't know if that makes sense. I went off the topic. But. No, no, it's it's amazing. And actually, um, Karim, you may have, may have a question, but just quickly, just to build on that, Robin, how perfect then in this horrible situation that we're facing now, in, in you know, the catastrophic situation in Gaza, but how perfect is it you know, historically speaking, that as soon as the ICJ renders its, uh, what's it called, provisional measures ruling, you know, last Friday, like literally within uh, 15 minutes or something like that, the U.S. and all of its white national, you know, white kind of ex-colonial or even still contemporary colonial genocidal powers, they all immediately say, well, we're going to pull our funding out of the honor war. I mean, it's like, it's, the, it's, it's where it, it takes us back in a way to the, to the genocidal formation you were talking about in nineteen in the nineteen early twentieth century, right? But here we are, twenty twenty four. We're we're South Africa is trying to is try, South Africa is trying to correct that stream to right the historical wrongs of the early twentieth century, and the white colonial powers are saying, no, nope, we're going to go right back to the beginning. We're going to go right back to the formation of genocide out of which we emerged. There's something kind of it's horrible, but it's it's there's a kind of a historical you know, an awful kind of historical poetry to it too. Like not poetic justice, poetic injustice. Right, no, exactly. I mean, it's, it, the way you frame it, I think is, is actually perfect because, um, you know, we know that UNRWA has been, you know, a target of the right for, forever. 
I mean, DeSantis, when he ran for office, he, he was talking about defunding UNRWA. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's an old thing. And it's also consistent with the kind of European bloc that from 1945 all the way to the present has been voting both with South Africa and voting with Israel constantly over and over again, and really doing everything it could to undercut UNRWA. I mean, U.S. support for UNRWA has always been questionable, you know, and always been limited. Um, and the, the amazing fact that they could even do this work with limited funding uh, is amazing. Uh, and one other thing is that what shocks a lot of people that I speak to is they don't understand how you can have a refugee population that for like 76 years, <laughs> like, like how, how could that be? Why, why would UNRWA have to last longer than that? And so imagine coming out of uh, uh, like African-American history where the Freedmen's Bureau during Reconstruction was like the UNRWA of the present. It was that um, agency that was supposed to help refugees deal with abandoned lands, deal with um, resettlement of peoples. And it was temporary. Um, UNRWA is not temporary. I mean, that's the thing. You know, that, that the idea of this temporary agency, which is not temporary, and it's actually a lifesaver for so many, to defund that is the continuation of genocide. I mean, it's, just, it's like so clear. Um, and it's so dangerous. Uh, Can I, uh, Raman, let me ask you, because you, you've, you know, you were in this, in this historical sweep you're talking about is really fascinating. Uh, you mentioned Jan Smuts and, you know, Mark Mazau wrote this, this really good book on, uh, on the idea of, of the UN. And, you know, he was trying to explain, uh, you know, how it is that Jan Smuts, this, you know, <laughs> you know, in this apartheid sort of South African white guy, very racist, but he's the one who helps, at least helps draft that, the, the, the only liberal part of the UN Charter, which is that preamble, you know, the rights of people as opposed to this discussion about states and state sovereignty. And his point being, in part, that it's, a, it's this connection with his losing, his feeling that the civilized world that you were talking about was losing itself in World War One, and then this World War Two, and the collapse and this fighting of these empires would lead to this white world collapsing. And so the idea was to try to bring these together and in a kind of decentralized way so that each in, in across the world, in Africa, in Australia, and you know, these different places, there would be this white kind of rule that would then be able to civilize those brown, black, whatever areas around them. Uh, and, and so there was this, this sense of loss of control. And then to go to what Sadie is saying, this very clear, you know, this ruling that comes out with South Africa in particular kind of leading this incredible thing. And the whole world was watching and, and, and just the way in which they were speaking and the, the way in which the delegation, there were women and men and black and white. And it's just this really incredible presentation. Forget even the substance, but the presentation was really something everybody picked up, whether you could follow the, the legalities or not, which most people can't, but just the way in which they were speaking. Uh, the, in, you know, you mentioned the colonizer's justice, and this is maybe the colonized justice, colonized justice. Uh, and then the reaction, this punitive, cruel, immediate, clearly coordinated, and they had obviously thought about it before, and this was coordinated, the shutting down of UNOA on some flimsy charge uh, you know, these threats of, of UNRWA was always there, but this immediate hostile takedown of the most savage kind to the most, you know, uh, uh, you know, people under genocidal attack and who can barely, you know, barely literally survive in this kind of war. And so this idea of, of this, it also shows, I think, this loss of control that this, as I said, you mentioned this white world that kind of colonized you know, you know, settler colonial world, that they're also now, this is a reaction kind of losing control. And so we go back to this notion of, you know, a, a something I thought about, which is in this 1960s period, and this attempt with the kind of the great third world and decolonization, and the General Assembly in which the, the third world tries to take over within the General Assembly and UNCTAD and some of the UN agencies, to set a new international economic order, a new political order, and at the same time, uh, you know, using these instruments, the UN, uh, which okay starts off as as an instrument of power and empire, but you know gets subverted at least in this period, 
and to try to set up a new economic and political order. And of course, that, 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 you know, that gets defeated. And, uh, but, but this notion of international law being something today where South Africa, where Palestine, Palestinians, where those in these conditions are um, still clinging on to. So this idea of international law not being necessarily just a function of empire, but something where the weaker part is able to hold on and create a certain order and recreate certain orders. And it's the those that are supposed to be in control, that have the military might and the economic might, that are subverting this international legal order that they had set up. And so it's this interesting kind of, uh, you know, contradiction, I think. Yes, yes. No, I think I think that's absolutely right. And what's interesting to go back to the, the language of civilized nations, the order, the, the idea of a world order in which there's a hierarchy, for many people, that was that was the white man's burden. In other words, the white man's burden was to civilize the natives and do this great gift, give them civilization. In fact, there, there are white South Africans right now saying, see what we did? We trained those people. <laughs> like we, we made them so smart. But this is this is the thing about like, like smut. Smuts is just one of many who believe this, that that our job is to civilize and and Part of what's interesting about the discourse around Israel and Israeli apartheid and ethnic cleansing is that their thing is that their position, and, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, is that these people can't be civilized. They are terrorists. We will move them. We will kill them. South Africa adopted the argument about um, uh about South, Black South Africans as terrorists, really, in the 1960s, they they did they had their genocidal um, uh, in, uh, uh, forms of dispossession. It goes back to 1652. We know all that, but there's something about the discourse in South Africa throughout from the early 20th century through the through really the 1960s, where like we're doing this for the people. We're we're basically creating. Uh, even the language of the Bantu stance was about um, uh, independent development. We're going to basically allow these people to, to develop their own culture. That is not the discourse in Palestine. It is, we want them out, uh, which I think does great against uh, this civilizing mission discourse. And UNRWA, and I think you're so right about UNRWA, occupies this interesting status as not being controllable. You know, UNRWA is a, uh, an agency of this United Nations, which is seen as the enemy by so many of the Western nations. Uh, and so therefore, it's not like, like if Israel had its own, like this is our relief fund, and we're gonna do this for the people. Um, that's very different from UNRWA because they can't control. It's exactly what you say. It's that lack of control which makes it dangerous. It also makes them vulnerable to this kind of defunding without there being like massive outrage. Um, and so this is a very precarious situation. And if there's ever, ever a textbook case of genocide, this is it. This is, <laughs> this is so blatant um, that it doesn't even have the pretense of we're doing this for the people. We're, we're trying to, to save them and preserve their culture. The irony, of course, of UNRWA, as, as Karim has, has taught me, and is that it was founded, of course, precisely not to advocate for Palestinian political rights. It's all about sort of just their humanitarian care, their wards of the international order, uh, but their dispossession, their history is all, in a sense, irrelevant to UNRWA's actual mission. So the, the irony is that, that the Western, the dominated UN creates UNRWA as a band-aid to the fact that they've been dispossessed. Um, but it, it, is there a way of just going back a little no, bit? Better someone, sorry, but this is important because you mentioned, sorry, but I, I really have to say this. And the whole point that I think kind of connects to this is precisely that UNRWA, you're right, begins it as this way as a band-aid, but then becomes precisely that which Palestinians themselves, and it's the only UN agency where the vast majority of the staff are actually Palestinian. You know, as opposed to, and it's the only one outside of the UNHCR, the only refugees, and it becomes the symbol of the right of return. And the reason you have all these 
you know, Western nations that are the donors and that are able to play these kinds of games today by, you know, defunding every time they, they get a bit upset, is that it is the store of the international responsibility towards Palestinian refugees and the right of return. It's the reason Arabs are not, or, you know, have not historically not been the donors. And in some ways, people say shouldn't be the donors is because the whole point is that the Arabs are dealing with other aspects of this question. And it's the Western countries that created this refugee problem and they are responsible internationally. It is their international obligation. And that explains why it is that there's this fanatical attempt by the Israelis and their supporters in America and others to shut down UNRWA because it removes this international responsibility and removes this, this symbol of Palestinian right of return, which is so, so important. That's a that's a fantastic point, Kedim. Uh, thank you. Th- thanks for the, for the actual really important. No, that's that's crucially important because it's true. If we focus only on on 49, 50, 51, it's a different picture. You're absolutely right. But Robin, can I just go back to this question that you, you raised about South Africa and Smuts? And of course, we can go back to World War One and the League of Nations. And Smuts, of course, was instrumental in the self the idea of self determination as a racist sort of principle of, of a hierarchy and and all this. But my, my question is, so the way you're, you're, you're educating our audience and our listeners with this idea that there is a, a South African colonized tradition um, and history of resistance and of interpretation of, of justice versus the colonizers, uh, racist, sort of separate but equal kind of notion, if not genocidal notion, there's a tension within the colonizers. But a lot of our listeners, and, and me in particular, and, and my brothers, we're always confused because when you go back to the historical record, you mentioned Du Bois, there is this question of, of and we're always shocked, and we're, it's always the most dispiriting part, is when you go back and you read about Du Bois and you read about how how Zionist Du Bois was in 48, um, and it's in 46, 47, 48. It's so distressing to us to read about Du Bois, and it's often used by Zionists to say, you see, look, the brilliant black liberation thinker was himself a Zionist. Therefore, Zionist is a national liberation movement or Zionism is, do you see what I'm saying? They always use, they always use Du Bois. And then they point to, uh, to, to MLK, of course, and they point to all these other phenomenal, historical, great black figures who were, who supported Zionism. So how do, how do you explain that to our listeners to tell us a little bit? I mean, how does that compare with, with the, the, the third world, South Africa, and then the, the, the shift that takes place later on? I mean, is there a way of explaining this to, to, to our listeners and audience? Because it's something that is always brought up. Yes, yes, yes. No, there's, there's a way. And, and be patient with me. Because <laughs> it's, it's a complicated story. I mean, on the one hand, you have Du Bois, but you also have Paul Robeson, you know, who was a very strong Zionist. In fact, uh, A. Philip Randolph. Um, by the way, um, uh, Bayard Rustin, who's now a big hero, he, he died of Zionism. I mean, he, he was a stone cold Zion. We could talk about him. But to go back to that moment, I mean, you got to imagine, first of all, before 1948, there, there's different varieties of Zionism. Um, there is like the left labor Zionism. Uh, whatever it manifested it to, whatever, however it manifested itself later, this was this idea that among, um, socialists and communists, that Zionism was the communist nationalism. You know, it was, they imagined a socialist state someplace in the world uh, without actually considering the consequences of dispossession, right? So all that sort of all pre-1948. Paul Robeson himself, like Du Bois, they were involved with the American Jewish Anti-Fascism Committee, um, you know, Robeson sang songs in Yiddish. They linked Jewish freedom to the creation of Israel. Du Bois himself certainly did this. Um, you know, there was uh, uh, a moment in which, you know, so 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 you have that you have Jewish Zionism, uh, and with that comes these black intellectuals who identify with Jewish Zionism as a kind of secular. Uh, a kind of secular identification with a nationalist movement, which is seen as a movement for freedom, okay? This is all before 48. And then you have those uh, black nationalists who mirrored Zionism, like Marcus Garvey. Um, they, you know, what they, they, they saw how Jewish Zionism resonated 
with the reading of Exodus in the Bible. And, and Garvey himself actually was toying with the idea of adopting Judaism as the religion of the Garvey movement, of the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Why? Not because, not only because a lot of his donors were Jamaican Jews, by the way, that's a, that's a true story, but also because one of, he had brought into his circle figures like, you know, Rabbi Arnold J. Ford, who uh, was, I, was a black uh, Jew who ended up going to Ethiopia. And so they saw Judaism and Zionism as the religion and ideology of an oppressed nation trying to create self-determination. So that, that all exists, right, at the same time. Um, now, why is it that someone like Du Bois, especially given the fact that Du Bois had become a Marxist, by 1948, he was identifying with the left, clearly. He, Du Bois and Robeson were as close to the Communist Party as you can get. Why is it? Well, the Communist Party's position was support Zionism. I mean, overall. And then something happens in 1956. I know a lot of times we think about 67 as a turning point, but what I'm finding is that 56 is the turning point because of, uh, you know, Israel's participation with Britain and France in the attack on uh, Egypt after Egypt is, uh, you know, nationalized the Suez Canal. Uh, why is this important? Well, one of the most important massacres, of course, takes place in Gaza. Uh, that is the massacre of this, by Israelis of Palestinians in refugee camps and communists. All, in Rafa, I mean, all places that we're talking about today, in 1956. And this is when Du Bois actually pulls back from Zionism. He actually, he, he basically is much more critical of Israel for the first time. Um, and he ends up, I mean, I wouldn't say that he ends up being anti-Zionist, but he definitely ends up being a sharp critic of, of Israel almost a lot of black leftists in the communist party begin to split over this question of 1956. Again, this is, this is a decade before 67. And I think that's, that, because, Robin, that, that, that's because of Africa. In other words, Egypt as Africa, as opposed to Palestine, as opposed to Palestinians, as opposed to solidarity with Palestinians. Is that my understanding? It's both of those things, meaning that, um, and I can mention Malcolm X and, and Dr. King in a second about this, but, it was primarily um, uh, the, the violation of, of Egyptian sovereignty, number one, the identification with Egypt as a heroic uh, nation, both for Africa and for the third world, but it's the reports of the massacre in Khan Yunus, Rafa, uh, and um, uh, I think it was one other, um, in that in Gaza that actually concerned a lot of people who are, you know, so in other words, we may not call it solidarity with Palestine generally, but certainly a critique of Israeli um, massacres of Palestinians. And that's where um, there, are two, there are two moments that I'm trying to deal with right now in, in thinking about that 56. And if you indulge me, both involve, uh, well, this, the, the issue involves both Dr. King and Malcolm X. So Malcolm X, we know, ends up visiting, um, goes to Egypt, he ends up visiting Gaza. In, and in 1964, he writes this article called Zionist Logic, where he calls Israel a kind of a new form of colonialism. He, he excoriates Israel and Zionism. Uh, and he points to, and what moved him was that visit to see and talk to people who were victims of the massacre in communists and Rafa, right? And again, this is, uh, you know, what, eight years earlier, but they have memories of this moment. The other thing is Dr. King. And again, I've written about Dr. King kind of post 67 or that moment of 67, but I, I begin to really think about uh, 1959. So Dr. King actually goes to Jerusalem, Nablus, 
Hebron, Nazareth, again, through Jordan to visit the Holy Site. This is 1959. He goes with his wife, Coretta Scott King. And he comes back and he gives a sermon in 1959, which calls Walk Through the Holy Land. And in that sermon, he tells the story of, um, of Jesus, like bearing his cross. And part of it's about like, you know, why did Jesus become a revolutionary? Because he, he describes Jesus essentially as a revolutionary, he pays this huge price. And he's a revolutionary against occupation, against the Roman occupation. He's, you know, so, so he's carrying his cross and he's about to be executed. He's, you know, he's been detained, everything. Uh, and he's carrying this cross and he stumbles. And according to King, a black man named, you know, Simon of Cyrene, uh, though he's not black, he's Libyan, right? But he, King calls him a black man, helps him carry that cross. Now, what King did was he changed the sermon, he changed the parable, basically, to fit his argument which is that he, he sort of presents Simon's act of bearing the cross as an act of solidarity with Jesus. When in fact, what Simon was doing was, was doing what the Romans told him to do. You know, he, he basically wasn't defying Roman law at all, but actually abiding by the law because his job was to help Jesus get there so he could die. Um, and he was being obedient, right? But King made him presented him as being obedient to the, uh, what he calls the unenforceable. And so in that sermon, King knows about the massacre in Khan Yunus. He knows about the massacre in Rafa. He knows about it. He's heard about it. It's in the black press, by the way. And that's where he does this funny thing where he, he presents Simon as representative of the third world um, uh, insurrection. And in the sermon, he praises the United Nations as like the the resurrection of the crucified League of Nations, right? Um, he and he says, and I have to quote this because says, you know, before there can ever be peace in this world, we must turn to an instrument like the United Nations to disarm the whole world and develop a world police power so that no nation will possess atomic and hydrogen bombs for destruction. And he goes on to say the UN is that force, um, and he believes in the UN. And it's no accident that just three years earlier, it was the director of UNRWA who, you know, of, of in, the, uh, in the Middle East, who submits this damning report to the General Assembly about the massacres in Khan Yunus and Rafa. And so imagine King identifying with the UN as a potential arbiter of a higher law, right? consistent with this kind of unenforceable moral and ethical order, uh, and that the UN would emerge as the principal um, uh, uh, a villain in the Zionist narrative, right? So I think that both King early on and Malcolm early on and Du Bois early on and a, a whole range of Black liberal slash leftists are moved by the massacre to rethink Israel's role. It's not a 100% turnaround or 180 degree turnaround, but it is um, a consideration that sets the stage later, uh, certainly for, for Malcolm X's statement, but for King's statement later. And I think for Du Bois's, um, what becomes, again, his critical stance toward Israel from 1956 until he dies in 1963. Again, he doesn't disavow Zionism. I think he sees Israeli state power as separate from the kind of vision of Zionism, which, which is still rooted in the kind of left Zionism that people believed in, which is just a dream. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. It it does make sense. It makes a lot of sense. But is that, is that, I mean, it, that's a very generous, I mean, that's, it's a crucial reading that you're providing, uh, Robin. But what about, I mean, so maybe shifting a little bit in terms of saying, but how do you, then do you account for the fact that somebody else could look at the same set of documents and say exactly as you're saying, 
that MLK, uh, Dr. King continued until, I mean, he, there's a shift about the Vietnam War. There's a relationship, obviously, between racism in America, anti-Black racism, poverty, war, imperialism. There's obviously a development in Dr. King in the 60s, uh, right? And But the what about the people who keep saying, but look, he was a Zionist until very late. So how do you, like, are you, are we doing an, are we an over generous in our reading of this 59 sermon as a way of how do we relate that to, to the fact that there's a documented tradition tr text? So let, so let me, let me, exp let me just further clarify. Um, I don't think King ever disavowed Zionism. See, what I'm suggesting is that there, they, that he and others were trying to make a separation between Israeli policies and Zionism. So in other words, King, I, I would argue that King was a Zionist, continued to be, but, but what I'm trying to, to figure out, for example, is that um, it's, like, it's like they wanted, they, they had a dream of what Zionism was supposed to be, and they wanted Israel to conform to that. They did not. They did not make the leap, which I think is an important leap to make. Is that it's Zionism's fundamentally a, an expression of state power, and and that's the leap that he wasn't willing to make. Now, why is that? Why did why did King have trouble? Um, I think there's a couple things going on, um, and I don't think it's simply a matter of the fact that he had a lot of uh, donors. Who you know? Because once he had any criticism of the Vietnam War, he lost a lot of a lot of support. That's the Vietnam War. Um, King, you know, was very um, like you know he was an Old Testament and New Testament you know person. He was a he was a religious figure who did really believe in historic Palestine as the land of the Jews. You know, they all agreed with that. Um, and he, but he wasn't interested in dispossession. Now, the thing with King is that, again, I'm not defending him at all, um, but I think that part of this, part of his interpretation of what Zionism is comes from his reading of Martin um, Buber. That he, he, he and Buber actually had a correspondence. They were very tight. Buber actually was writing on behalf of King uh, to, the, to the federal government you know, um, to the president, to, to, to Lyndon Johnson and to Kennedy at some point. And so why, why Buber? Well, Buber's interesting in that he was an advocate, he was a hardcore Zionist, but an advocate of a binational state. That was his position. He was involved in the, um, the not just the defense of Palestinians, but try, he was actually working toward trying to uh, ensure the right to return. And for that reason, he became a pariah in Israel. He never left Israel, nor did he ever disavow Zionism. He's, he's like, my Zionism is about trying to create um, a, a religious, ethical position that the Jews would accept their um, global responsibility as an ethical people. And so therefore, there is no, because Buber's position was there should be no dispossession. There should be no removal of the, of the Palestinian Arab, so-called Arab population, right? And that we're going to live in peace and harmony. And so when you look at Buber, my question, of course, is how much of Buber's writings was King familiar with? King quoted Buber all the time. And, but he was never willing to say, you know, like King was never willing to say, well, my Zionism is this one. Instead, he was silent. He just simply said in a very um, generic way that I'm a Zionist, I support Zionists, and I support Israel's right to, uh, to exist as if that's a question, right? Now, that, there's that story. But there's another story about King, which I think is worth considering, is that 67... Um, yeah, 67, he was, he was actually planning to go on this pilgrimage, 5,000, something like 5,000 Black people, some, some ridiculous number, were going to go on this pilgrimage to the Holy Land and visit Israel. And King was about to go. Uh, and then um, 
it was planned, it was announced in March. Actually, it was announced like six months before. So war takes place, you know, in June. And then, of course, the trip is canceled. And behind the scenes, King is like, well, we can't go now because if we go, it's going to look like we're endorsing Israel's position. You know, he says this. He doesn't say it out loud, but he says it in private correspondence and conversations. He says, you know, and it looks like Israel's not going to give up Jerusalem. That's what he says. Um, now, what does this mean? Does it mean that he's anti-Zionist? No. It means that he he is still holding on to an idea of Zionism as an expression of justice coming, exuding from the Holy Land. And I think the thing we have to investigate is how did they understand Zionism? Uh, what did they see it? How did they see its, its function? And that's where 67 becomes really important because as you know, that's the year when the war itself opened up the, the doors for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, for the Black Panther Party, for um, Revolutionary Action Movement, for all these movements to say explicitly what Malcolm X said in 1964, <laughs> and that is that Zionism is colonialism, straight up. So, Robin, just on this, if just a quick couple of, oh, hello? Yeah, sorry, Robin, just a, a, a quick couple of questions. Um, one thing, so Martin Buber is, is, is a, you know, it's, of course, he was also a colonial Zionist in the sense that he was living in Palestine. Um, I think he, he was not living, living in our family, in our family home in Jerusalem. I, I, I think so. I, I think that that's what I, that's what I was told. Yeah, he was. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah. I visited it and he was there. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't there, but he had, he had. There are people like Hans Cohn and others who, who broke with Martin Buber over this issue because they said you can't in the twenties, even in 29 saying you can't, there's no way to, to, to be a Zionist in Palestine without acknowledging the fact that that's coming at the expense of the indigenous native population. And, and so, and, and Buber, um, and others, Judah Magnus and others, the binationalists wanted a binational state, even though that meant that they, and they were wanted a binational state where Jewish immigration would continue despite the fact that Palestinians were opposed. So there's a, there's a whole colonial dimension to binationalism. But let's leave that aside for a second. Let's focus on this. When you keep saying that there, it's very interesting because it's, it's almost troubling to, I'm sure, to many of our listeners, when you say that there are many different forms of Zionism. But Edward Said, of course, talks about Zionism from the standpoint of its victims, the Palestinians. So how do you reconcile what sounds like a liberal Zionist position that we hear today all the time? Oh, there are many forms of Zionism despite the fact that there's one obvious form of Zionism on the ground that, that's wreaking havoc uh, for the Palestinians and also for people inside Israel. Um, how do you reconcile that with this discourse of saying, well, there are many forms of Zionism? Because really there's, there's a state form of Zionism. There's a project. So is there a danger of, of people misunderstanding what you're saying about MLK and all these people? Yeah, they, 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 they can't be reconciled. And I, and I would never argue that they can be reconciled. Um, part of the question is, why is it that King or, or Du Bois would hold the positions they hold? It doesn't make it right. <laughs> it doesn't make it justified, nor does it make it anti-Zionist. So part of what I'm trying to answer the question, like how do we understand why King could do the things and say the things that he says? And part of it is, you know, the dangers, to me, the danger of Zionism is precisely the fact that like it's like apartheid, but it's even worse than apartheid because the danger of Zionism is precisely that there's a way in which its origins, its roots, its connections to other movements allow for these multiple interpretations, right? And that that to me that's the issue. It doesn't it doesn't at all take King off the hook or Du Bois off the hook or any. But what it does explain is why is it that they can reconcile both um, uh, the, their support of Zionism and the support of, the, of what they, again, they, to use the language, the Arabs. And so I think there are two, there are two things going on. 
Uh, one is that at the end of King's life, I don't, I, I think that he becomes more and more critical of Israel and he becomes even angry with Israel's uh, position. Uh, and then the second thing is that, um, you know, the, the, the fundamental break of recognizing Zionism uh, as the logic of colonialism, that opens up the pathway for a deeply anti-Zionist and principled position from 1967 on to the present coming out of Black movements. I'm not saying it wasn't there, because look, I, there's examples. George Schuyler in 1948, he's writing about the Nakba. He's saying there's no, there's no principled Zionism. He's saying that. Um, and he's very clear about that, but he's like one exception to the rule. Um, so again, I don't want to, um, I, I, I think it's important, and this is the work that you all do that's so important, is to recognize that the ideological and state policy, statecraft, and the, um, the genocidal violence, that they're part of one process. Um, the parsing out, Robert, can I? Sorry, I just, I, I'm I'm really fascinated by this, and you know your description, and and it makes sense historically to say, I mean, at least from the outside, for me to sort of understand that people like MLK could be sympathetic on the one hand to a Palestine story, but at the same time be sympathetic to Zionism in its own way, as he would interpret it as a Christian. Let's say, if we just fast forward to today. Does what's going on in Gaza today, just to connect it, you know, dispel that from those that would follow MLK and that tradition? Is, is there any more room for this being able to say, OK, I can recognize this, but, I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm holding both at the same time and both of them are are important. Can you still do this in this day and age? And just when you're reading that a thousand black pastors have you know, called for a ceasefire, I'm not sure what that means, if that's just sort of inside democratic in politics, or if that's something that recognizing that these, simply these things can't hold. Right, right. No, <laughs> it's a it's a great question because I the way I see it is that um, no, I don't know anyone who's actually trying to reconcile uh, King Zionism with a critique of Israel. What I see is is um, is the uh, the Hasbara type organizations and, you know, stand, stand for Israel. All these different organizations are using King, right, as a way to justify Zionist policies. What you don't see is people kind of threading the needle. I don't see that at all. What I see is uh, people drawing on King um, in terms of his principled anti-war position. In other words, uh, break the silence then apply to uh, Israel as opposed to, you know, there's something we can, we can recover from King about his position on Palestine. Most people don't even know his position on Israel. What they know is that, you know, some of these, the Zionist organizations in the United States, they feel like they're just lying, <laughs> you know. But see, my problem is that I'm a historian and I got it. I have to try to understand um, where, what, what's a lie, what's not a lie, and and how, say, King got to this, this pathway. And I think to understand that is also to understand a very dangerous position that King had taken too, which is relevant to today. King's position on, on the quote unquote Arab world was that the problem with the Arab world, and including Palestinians, was poverty. That, that's why he called for a kind of uh, Marshall Plan as a way to resolve that conflict without actually recognizing that it's exactly the apartheid policies and dispossession that produced the poverty in the first place. Like he didn't, he couldn't even see that. King couldn't see that. And so now I think we've got reached a point where that is, that's not the debate. Um, the, the debate is, to me, most people don't even want to deal with the question of how to defend King. What they want to deal with is how to end this war, how to end the occupation, how to end um, the, the the Zionist state, you know, and as it stands, like, that's what they're they're focusing on. And now these black ministers, um, many of the same ones, I'm sure I saw when I was in East Jerusalem, getting off the buses uh, in droves with their congregations, 
of visiting the Holy Land, all paid for by Israel, right? And I think they are the ones that are beginning to break now because strictly over the question of humanitarian uh, crisis, I, whether or not they're going to break from uh, Zionism as an ideology, it's hard to say because that's a huge leap. Look, I'm, a, I'm the grandson of a, of a Baptist minister who took many trips to Israel himself. Um, it's a huge leap for them to basically reject what is the kind of biblical law, right? And so all they can do is bracket it, set it aside, and take a principled position uh, for justice and for the end of occupation. That other battle is another battle, which I don't know, you know, it's not one that I'm necessarily have skin in the game in, um, but it's one that I think is gonna continue to rage and it's going to, and that's why I, I want to bring up this question of like variety, the notion of varieties of Zionism, because that's going to be the pathway for people to be able to make the claim that there's something uh, uh, positive about Zionism that could be, you know, this this was this was um, Buber's position. This was the position of a lot of um, uh, uh, pro-Zionist intellectuals who felt like they're against occupation, but there's something worth saving. And, and I think that, and I deal with this all the time, you know, well, Sari and I, we deal with Zionists on our campus, we're liberal Zionists, who are like, well, don't you understand? Like, my Zionism is not theirs. <laughs> you know, they say this, but we know the truth. <laughs> yeah, they all do that. Uh, Robert, we want to, This, I mean, that was an amazing uh, dive, which is exactly what we wanted to do in this podcast is to go back historically and retrace, recover some of this, ter- or go over some of this territory and terrain. Um, and we want to come back to the present as well, obviously, especially to what's happening in our, all of our universities in different kinds of ways. Um, but just quickly, just to connect the dots, like just in a, in a maybe more succinct way, how do we get from, so there's this kind of, there's the Martin Luther King moment, there's a set, there's a kind of, uh, let's call it, He's trying to reconcile different kinds of pressures in himself that don't, I, you know, that maybe don't ever really get reconciled in a satisfactory way. But then, meanwhile, there's there's the Black Muslim experience in America, right? There's the path that gets followed then by Malcolm, by Muhammad Ali, and it goes on. There's short soon afterwards the Black Panthers opens up another path, right? Which then, which then you know, which we can follow, you know, which goes through the '70s and so forth, and then. The, at the end, the, the kind of receiving that experience, the more radicalized, I would say, experience from the late 60s onwards through the 70s, v- p- you know, partly via the Panthers, but partly through other kinds of trajectories, we end up with BLM, with Black Lives Matter, you know, it and and that which you've written about, like that moment of convergence between 2014 Ferguson and Gaza, you know, that. That again, one of these moments of incredible poetic injustice, you know, where or historical injustice, you know, happening, kind of why did it happen that 2014 both those events happened at exactly the same time? You know, what does that say? But just to quickly kind of trace the path that gets us from the sort of let's say uh, maybe equivocation is too dismissive a term, but from that equivocation of the 1960s through the you know the radicalization of of Black intellectuals, black activists in the U.S., the Panthers, you know, Angela Davis, like that trajectory, and then getting us to, to Black Lives Matter. Right. So here's here's the short version of it, because the one thing I neglected to mention is that um, at, by 1970 there is a um, a retrenchment on the part of black support for Zionism among people like A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin. Uh, Roy Wilkins, uh, Shirley Chisholm, you know, who was considered fairly radical, uh, even John Conyers, who ends up changing his mind. So and, yeah, to, so 2016 was really, really significant, precisely because the Movement for Black Lives put out this document uh, calling um, what was happening to Palestine genocide. So basically, as we reach the moment we're in now, um, there's no possible way that we're going to go back to a debate about 
whether or not Zionism is good or bad, you know, what, what varieties of Zionism. Um, I think that's a debate that may be a scholarly one, but certainly not a political one in terms of what we're dealing with today. Um, and the other issue, of course, is that precisely because of the changing landscape, the sea change in political um, uh, 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 winds, you know, the anti-Semitism uh, uh, claim, the weaponizing of anti-Semitism is not working the way uh, that I think Zionist thinks it should work. It's, you know, pe I mean, you may have institutions forcing uh, people out of jobs or whatever, it's not slowing down this process um, or slowing down the movement in support for a free Palestine. Robin, I wanted to ask, I mean, th this is fascinating. And so you, th this, the movement within the, the African-American community to support Palestine has increased. And, and the discussion we had previously uh, about the different strands of Zionism, we're not going back to that in terms of contemporary political discussions. But there's this other side, which is, you know, we were talking in this period, this is also the period where Barack Hussein Obama, uh, you know, from, it, if I remember correctly, he came just at, you know, as the, the Gaza war, in fact, of 2008 at the end was starting and he had this little very small confrontation as you know sort of at a, at a distance with Netanyahu in fact I think was prime minister then as well and then he quickly backed down and didn't say anything during that that, that during that particular war and then you know so there was a bit of this uh, they don't like each other very much etc but he sort of withdrew from that um, but there was also this also so Obama but this is tradition of these uh, African-American politicians, Condoleezza Rice, who famously came to, to Lebanon and kind of declared the new Middle East order and, and, you know, was lampooned a lot here and in the region for this, for this wonderful new order that she introduced and is, you know, still the impact, we still feel it to this day here. Uh, and so there, you know, there's, and, and, and this, this character, Robert uh, Wood, um, you know, in fact, both the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., but also this deputy, Robert Wood, who was so gleefully raising his hand in the, in the last veto that the U.S. hit on, on the Gaza ceasefire. How do you, you know, what, what, what do they represent? Not to, mention, not, to mention the vice, not to mention the vice president. Not to mention, but, but oh, I mean, yeah. do, they, do they represent something or is it just these are ambitious politicians? Um, I, I think they represent two things. One, they do represent ambitious politicians. Um, but I also rep think they represent the continuation of that uh, post-67 retrenchment Black elite. Um, in other words, uh, and I've said this many times, there is there is no unified Black position on Palestine, and there will never be. Uh, and, you know, and part of it has to do with the fact that we have a Black, call it petty bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie, a, a black political class uh, that, you know, not just goes with the winds, but actually are deeply invested in the state of Israel. I mean, I think about, um, I mean, Cla Claudine Gay was a victim, right, of, of all this. And yet her position was very staunchly in support of Israel. She, she was not. I mean, if anything, she was she was something of, of, of a Zionist. She wasn't. She, she she threw the Palestinian students and those pro-Palestinian students under the bus, and still uh, could not prevail. But then, when you think about people like um, uh, uh, Lloyd Austin, you know, who I think should be. I mean, I'm an abolitionist, but he should be brought up on charges. Um, I mean, because he, he's not only very strong supporter of Zionism and U.S. foreign policy, but he's a direct beneficiary of the genocide of war. Because we know, uh, we look at the stock prices of Hewlett Packard, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, Raytheon. He worked for Raytheon as a shill for Raytheon. But this is this is where his bread and butter is. Um, this is where the military's bread and butter is. This is where this elite is. Uh, and so I don't, I see them as, part of the enemy uh, structurally, 
not not they're not they can't be persuaded um and and you're going to continue to see more and more black faces um uh you know doing this work i think about karen um jean pierre she is the queer uh Pauly. Pauly. and she <laughs> she's she's from martinique i mean so here she is from Aimé Césaire's land. She's considered to be queer, progressive, and all this other stuff. Uh, and her behavior, I mean, you know, as a spokesperson for, for Biden, you know, it's, it is appalling, you know. So this is what, so increasingly we're going to see more and more Black faces uh, doing this work. And we just cannot be confused. One of my concerns, and I know I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, uh, isn't the Black conservatives or even the Black liberals, but a particular strain of um, people identify themselves as left, but I don't think they are, of a kind of Afro-pessimism that says there can be no um, solidarity uh, because of the deep uh, nature of anti-blackness, uh, that Palestinian anti-blackness means it can not be uh, any common ground. Now, not everyone believes that who calls themselves that afro pessimist and I don't want to cast aspersions, but I think it's a very dangerous position to take because it's, it's a way to position yourself as a radical by saying, well, that's that's not like our genocide is way worse, and they treat us badly, and so therefore we're not going to stand up for them. Um, it's it's a very dangerous position because it's attractive. Is that an intellectual position that's widespread? Do you feel, or I mean, is that are we talking about? Is that an intellectual position, or is that actually in the? Are you? Is that how widespread is that position itself? Well, I think it is more widespread. Then we think. I think it's hard to shrink a little bit because um, it's very hard for people to hold on to that position right now. Uh, but it has grown, and I'm, when I say grown, there's two. There's two things. It's an intellectual position in the university, in the academy, where people are writing this um, or making these arguments. But then it has redounded to the uh, political movements, where people are beginning to sort of question. Um, the uh, the the usefulness, the extent of solidarity, and what is true is that yes, there's a long history of dealing with anti-blackness uh, everywhere, including Palestinian Americans in, you know, who are working and living in communities in which they may occupy some kind of position, um, if not authority, certainly as as merchants as, you know, so I mean, this is the big complaint. It's, it's a complaint that's been going on for a very long time, but that's not the same thing. It's, you can't conflate that with the question of the, of um, Israel's occupation of Palestine with the genocidal policies. So I think that it becomes an excuse for some people to say, you know what, that's not my fight. Uh, uh, and when in fact, part of the power of that moment in, from 2014 on is the recognition that solidarity is not just fundamental, but solidarity is not the same as sameness. Analogies work only to a certain degree. Um, sometimes the, 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 the use of a politics of analogy gets in the way of recognizing the importance of solidarity. So. The politics of analogy could be easily dismissed by Afro pessimists by saying, well, no, that their struggle is not the same as ours. Yes, it's not. But that doesn't mean that it's not all connected. You know, I'm look, I'm an internationalist. I still consider myself a communist. I think that all these struggles are connected. I want to see a liberated world. Uh, and the the um, the ground zero of that liberated world, as far as I'm concerned, is Palestine. It is the last great direct colonial occupation in all of its rawness. It is what uh, people in 1944-45 tried to block in terms of what the United Nations could be. It is that place 
along with the Western Sahara, places like that. But Palestine is it. And we, it's the lessons for all anti-colonial movements, past, present, and future, are right there in Gaza, in the West Bank, and in the diaspora. You see, so that's that's the way I see it, you know. I think that's that's an amazing place to stop because like we couldn't possibly sum it more eloquently than you just did, Robin. But I just want one last question. Sorry, do you, you're kind of saying this, I suppose, but do you think that the genocide in Gaza is it's not just like the straw that broke the camel's back or you know something like that, but something it's a it's a it marks a much more fundamental shift, not just for Black Americans but for people in general around the world and maybe maybe in generational terms maybe in other kinds of terms but is gaza the kind of this is the common like what we're seeing before our very eyes with a hundred thousand people more or less killed injured under the rubble the entire all the all 80 percent of the housing gone 90 percent of the population displaced all the universities destroyed all the hospitals being destroyed the and now the cutting of funding to UNRWA, meaning perhaps god knows how many more people who are going to die of starvation and disease and so forth. Is, is Gaza the fundament, a, a fundamental turning point, historically speaking? But also, Robin, sorry, but also, you know, just to go back to what we started with and the question of South Africa and the global South, it seems to be another, I mean, is this the starting point of that politics again? Yes, I, th- I think so. I, I guess I see two things. One is that God, at this moment, the post-October 7th moment is a turning point, but it builds on a series of turning points that all begin with Gaza. In other words, 2008, 2009, 2014, 2021. 2000. In other words, Gaza has been like the, the site, at least for the last uh, decade and a half. It The, the word Gaza basically means... Um, genocidal violence and resistance. And I think the big turning point which makes this different uh, is both the scale of the violence and um, and, the breakout. No one expected anything like that to happen. Maybe some people expected it, but it shocked the world that, and, and that shock, which initially led to a kind of, oh boy, this is gonna be terrible, it's gonna come down to, oh, this as horrible as this is, um, things can't go back the way they were. Um, I, I wish I could be more confident that this turning point is a short-term transformation, but I think what we're seeing is gonna be a long-term horrific war that will spread beyond Gaza uh, beyond the West Bank and beyond just the geopolitical situation, but, least, but I mean, it's it's a it's a war, um, a, a war against genocide that's going to take on so many different uh, levels and, and sites uh, around the globe, and in some ways, it is our Vietnam. Uh, meaning that we've got to hold on and continue to fight. So it's sad to even think in those terms because every day, every day people are dying, every single minute. Um, And it's unacceptable. And what I find so terrifying is precisely what you're saying about the fact that, that UNRWA could even be defunded, even people could think about that rather than doing the opposite, saying, you know what? Uh, we're going to go in and we're going to basically force a ceasefire. We're going to cut off all funding to Israel. We're going to increase the funding to UNRWA. Uh, We're going to do everything we can to save lives, but that's not uh, what's happening. And, you know, it is, it it is our Vietnam. It is our Spain in 1936. It is, it is everything, you know, in terms of the future of humanity. Thank you, Robert. We couldn't put it better than that. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Robert. Thanks a lot, Robin. This was fascinating. So, Kenny, that was an amazing conversation with Robin Kelly. What did you What did you think? Uh, I thought it was in- incredibly enlightening. I mean, this 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 history 
of you know this the African American engagement uh, in 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 with the whole question of Palestine, uh, and the way he ends it, I think he it, you know really hits it where he talks about Gaza as the turning point. Um, but just as we've had in previous episodes of this podcast, uh, including with Ina Pape and others, there's a sense that there's a turning point. It's the end. It's it's the end of something, the beginning of something else. But we all seem to agree that it's still going to be an extremely violent kind of unfolding of this. I mean, it's not just going to end. There's, there's going to be a tremendous amount of violence, I think, going forward. And I, I, my sense is that's, uh, th- that's correct. Yeah, violence, violence on the ground, but, but transformation here, here in the U.S. And, and obviously around the world as well. And what's striking is this, that you know, going back through that history that we were that he was tracing for us going back to, you know, the 19, the 1950s, 19, well, 1948 itself, obviously the 1950s, 1960s, that this kind of slow sort of convergence that with certain equivocation and so forth uh, in the black struggle in America that with, with the Palestinian struggle for, for freedom, you know, and then this, what we now see is this sort of an acceleration as we get into the 2000s, you know, 2008, 2004, 2014, 2021, this catastrophe that's happening now in Gaza, there's a kind of, there's a turn that's, and there's no turning back. So I think the, the, if we're going to look for optimism, uh, which I'd like to do because we live in such a, this is such a dark and desperate moment, but if there is optimism, it is this sense in growing solidarity, which has come up across all of our, all of the other interviews we've done in this, in this podcast so far, there's a growing sense of solidarity. Uh, what Ivan Pape, to go back to that in, to that discussion, what he calls global Palestine, what Richard Falk t- talked about in terms of the legitimacy, you know, the, the struggle of a legitimacy. I think there's no question that the all, despite the horror, or maybe because of the horror of Gaza, there's a massive boost in solidarity that, in the long run, hopefully will will make a will, you know will help bring about justice. But in the short run, it's looking it's looking pretty awful. Yeah, so I, I I agree totally. But I you know since I am in Beirut and uh, you know the the questions of justice is very far from the the feeling and the tone that we can sense over here. And instead, it's 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 more the focus is on the question of violence and the impending this great war people talk about. The idea that this Biden administration with all of his satellite kind of countries like the UK and others that are helping in this, uh, that are pushing increasingly towards this war. I mean, it, it, I still find it incredible that all that people from Yemen to Palestine to Lebanon are calling for and Iraq is to say, let's just have a ceasefire in Gaza. And then, you know, we go from there. And th- this is just being refused at every single turn. And so this war expands and expands and expands. And there's going to be more reaction and counter reaction. And this can, this is, you know, we're, we're sensing it here is something which is really quite dangerous and that can go and can get worse and worse. And, and so, I, so yes, the justice question is something that gets, I think, uh, you know, played out in various places. And I think over the longer term, I think is very important. But unfortunately here, the sense is more that dwelling of that intermediate period where the extreme violence that people in Gaza, obviously in particular, are feeling. And these people that are going to have to, even when there is a ceasefire eventually, they're going to have to pick up, you know, I, I, it's unimaginable to even think how they can, how they're going to rebuild their lives, you know, in, in that immediate term, schools and hospitals and, and all of this. Uh, and now this attack on UNRWA, as, even if it's symbolic, I mean, it's, you know, even if it's symbolic, because money will... It's it's no it's obviously material, but you know this it, you know it, it, there'll be eventually funds that come. But it's it's you know let, let's say it's symbolic and material both. The idea is that this this cruelty towards individuals and to families and to people in Gaza and around, and now we're seeing it in the West Bank, but Gaza in particular, it's just un, it's it's be, defies you know being able to talk about it. Uh, but but that this is spreading, that this this sense of violence, a sense of 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 uh, inability to to just stop something, it's it it almost feels. That's why I was going back to the question of smuts and this when we were talking about it with Robin Kelly, 
which is the sense of is is the US losing control? And so therefore, isn't this reaction not one of power and control? Yes, they can bomb from just like this way they can bomb from above and destroy and kill. No, nobody challenges that thing. But it's really what what I take out of this, or what I've taken out of this war from here is the incredible weakness that the Israelis have. The Israeli military has been shown to be weak, except from above, from hitting from above, but it's been weak. And it's been weak since at least 2006 in the Lebanon war here, and that's been exposed psychologically and even militarily. America is weak in that everything it wants to do and every time it tries to threaten, it sends its aircraft carriers, it does all of these, and yet it's being hit by the Yemenis, it's being hit by the Iraqis uh, and by others. And the th this threat is growing. And it's no longer something that's insignificant. So it, it, this sense of weakness, and as these countries and these areas are being weakened and these other ones are coming about, well, yeah, the violence and destruction can be incredible, potentially. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's what's on the horizon is very bleak. But, the, but just to cycle back to this question of opposition and, and resistance, you know, uh, not just you know, in the the, the so-called axis of resistance, but on the ground here in the U.S. as well. You know that there's another poll today showing Biden's popularity and his approval rating. It's 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 in the gutter, basically. I think if I remember right, it's lower than Trump's ever was. It's historic, it's yeah. Clearly, and 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 you can see the graph starts going down in October. I mean, it's not there's no coincidence here, especially among youth. I mean, his the the, the his 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 disapproval rating among you know younger Americans is it's like near 80% at this point. It's, it's kind of, which is, which tracks also with what younger voters say about, about Zionism, about the Israeli state, about what's happening in Gaza. I mean, there's a kind of, there's a very, very clear correlation to all these things. So, which is sign for hope in the future, if not for the awful present that we're all living through right now. All right, well, on, the, on that good word, let's see. Uh, thank you.